Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, this morning, uh, Brian and Lola sent us a beautiful video that's online. Um, I think it's from the Lutheran Church and it's uh, like uh, nationally, like I think it comes from the United States of America, but it's beautifully done. Um, but we were hoping to show it, but there's a bit of a copyright uh, breakage, we think, if we do. So we don't want to break copyright licenses. Um, but you, you, after the service, you may want to type it in. <laughs> of course, if the service isn't that good, you could always do it during the service. But um, maybe you want to write down Praise Song for the Pandemic by Christine Walters Paintner. So Praise Song for the Pandemic, and then you can watch it. And if we can figure out the copyright situation, um, we might um, play it next week uh, at the beginning of our service next week. But anyway, it's something you'll enjoy watching, uh, Praise Song for the Pandemic. So today, the, the focus scripture is the story of Doubting Thomas, and it's always the story that follows Easter Sunday. So we always look at the story of Doubting Thomas today, and and uh, we are. And um, I'm just going to, yeah, just say a few more words. Um, the passage ends with this line that says that we may have life in his name. And uh, I wanted to start our service by commenting on that because the the author of those lines might have meant it differently. We might, we might understand it differently, what it means to have life in the name of Jesus. But something that I have been learning about is when we're lost in our mind and our thoughts, which I am a lot, I just find that I, I am lost in my mind and my thoughts a lot, and I think a lot. And often when I'm thinking, I'm not present. I'm usually somewhere else. My body can be <laughs> wherever my body is, but my mind is somewhere else. And, um, and we spend a lot of time then in our minds and often then uh, in the past, in the future, in some imaginary place. Because whenever we're in our minds, we're, we're just not where we are. We're not present. And it's possible that when we spend so much time in our minds and our thoughts, we actually absent ourselves from life. Because life is always happening here and now. And Jesus, uh, we have it recorded that he said, um, the road is hard and the gate is narrow that leads to life. And one way to interpret that is that the, the narrow the narrow road, the, the hard road, the narrow gate is the now. And it's really hard to live in the present moment in the now. And um, it is narrow because we want to fall off that path and go somewhere else. And, and so uh, today there will be, I want to share with you thoughts. And, um, but always in spirituality, we need to bring ourselves back to the present moment. And so right now, be present, maybe take a conscious breath, be aware of where you are and be aware of who you're with. Uh, be aware of your body and your sitting and your room and just come back to the present moment uh, because that is where life is. And Jesus may be one who taught presence and helped us help people find life, come back to life. And, um, and indeed, Jesus called it life in all its fullness. Okay, so here we are, present in life. And now I'm going to ask Carolyn and Greg, I'm going to mute myself, and they're going to unmute themselves. And... Uh, <clears throat> They're going to lead us in this beautiful hymn. It's an Easter hymn, but it's a spring hymn, obviously. And uh, it's one of my favorites. So take it away, Carolyn and Greg. The spring has come, let all the church be ordered. The world has 
Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> An Easter prayer that's printed in Voices United. Uh, beautiful words. God of grace and glory, by the death and resurrection of your beloved child, your reign of wholeness has been unleashed within our bent and broken world. Open us to your empowering grace that we may be bearers of your world redeeming love through the resurrected Christ our dignity, our power, and our peace. Amen. A quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, we have a tendency to think in terms of doing and not in terms of being. We think that when we are not doing anything, we are wasting our time. But that is not true. Our time is first of all for us to be. To be what? To be alive, to be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving. And that is what the world needs most. Now, Karen Green is going to read our scripture today, and we have it printed on the screen there. And Karen, uh, we'll get you to unmute yourself so we can hear you and then uh, um, let you read our scripture. Yeah, we can hear you there now, Karen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, because I don't know how to mute or unmute. The first reading today is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. We are, re we are reading words of encouragement written by an elder in Rome to other followers of Jesus in Asia Minor who are going through difficult times. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The gospel reading is the second reading from John 20, 
verses 19 to 31. Today's reading about doubting Thomas always follows Easter. The stories makes the point that Thomas wasn't there last week on the first Sunday of the resurrection. He can't read that word. He won trust. He wouldn't trust what others are telling him. He wants a first-hand Easter experience for himself. So a week later, on today, Jesus appeared again, and Thomas is moved to belief. The writer of the story has Jesus say how blessed a person is who believes without evidence. As the Gospel of John was written, 70 years after the resurrection, that was how everyone had to believe in Jesus. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the second week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. The Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But they, these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Wonderful. Uh, so, Carolyn and Greg are going to um, well, sing this song. <clears throat> it was written by a man who passed away a number of years ago who was a United Church minister in Winnipeg, uh, Rob Johns. Um, it's in Voices United and it tells the story of Doubting Thomas. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you, Carolyn and Craig. Well, I think we're, um, well, by the way, I just think uh, sometimes I struggle, Carolyn, you've got such a beautiful voice and then you play the flute so beautifully. So I'm wondering, uh, I was thinking this morning if you could sing and play the flute at the same time, it would be ideal, but anyway. Okay, it's uh, time for the story. And uh, whenever it's story time, I always wonder what I'm going to say. Hey, hello, hello. <laughs> hey, story time. I love story time. Hey. Hi, Benny. Hi. It's really, oh, you don't have your hat on today either. Because. I don't either. No one said to. Uh, that's right. It's the Sunday after Easter, so we don't yeah. do Easter bonnets on this day. How, how was your week? I had a great week. Nice. I'm loving. I'm sorry, people. Oh, hi, everyone. Hi. Hey there. <laughs> hi, Belle. I saw your stitch earlier. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm sorry you're all inside, but it makes it nice for me because I can go explore better. And I found a little free lending library, and it had a book. And this is story time. <laughs> can I get it? Uh, that, you know, that'd be great, but I just want to point out, Benny, that um, our daughter, Amelia, might have yeah. made that lending library uh, here in Fairmont, yeah. and uh, there's a lady online, Shirley, who worked with Amelia, and so anyway, oh, that's hi, a little Shirley, fun. Amelia told me about you! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me get it. Yeah, a book would be great, thank you. That would save me from knowing what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Oh my gosh. Here it is. Oh. <laughs> okay. I can't read it. Well, here, you take okay. it. Um, I thought I read it. I loved it. It fit the times, I thought. Okay. Can we read it this morning? Like you, um, you mind, I'd like to. Did you mind reading it? Because I'm a good reader. Okay, perfect. I bet Anna Lee, I bet you're out there and you can read. Okay. Anna. And hopefully Elliot's there and will like it. So I'm going to just put it on the computer really quick. And here. And here and here. Oh, there it is. Rito's gondola. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Oh, cool. Okay. So Benny, um, thank you for being here and thank you for bringing this book. And if you want to read it okay. to us, I'll just flip the pages. Thank you. Guido's gondola. Near an old pier in Venice, where small children play, Guido's gondola ferry tourists each day. Nice. The young rat enjoyed the tourism trade, rowing at noon with a breeze in the shade. Along Lover's Lane, the gondola swayed, carrying sweethearts as soft music played. With rides so romantic, charming, and quaint, tourists loved Guido and thought him a saint. Wow. Gracious and helpful, yet light as a feather, 
Kids feared he might blow away in bad weather, but Guido's big heart made up for his size. He was tremendous in everyone's eyes. One day, he stopped to pick up a client who climbed aboard with trunks that were giant. Look at them all. Whew. A motor, the man said. That's what you need to make your job easy and give your boat speed. See, I tried to sound like the man. You yeah. did. Your life will be better. Business will grow. Think of the time that it takes you to row. Mm -hmm. That night, Guido drifted beneath a bright moon to sweet serenades from a faraway tune. In the morning, he arose with one thought in mind. A motor, he wondered. Perhaps it is time. He picked out a motor, a fireball red, then changed his mind for a blue one instead. The man had been right in the rightest way. The new speedboat business increased every day. So many people, so much stuff to tote. Guido worked fast with his super speed boat. One day, a rather large woman climbed in with two chubby children and one who was thin. She worried the speedboat may not stay afloat. What you mean, my dear, is a much bigger boat. Ooh, good sound, eh? Thanks. That night, neath a wondrous star-studded sky, Guido's gondola puttered on by. But the next morning, with ink on his tail, he painted a sign that said, boat for sale. It didn't take long for the speedboat to sell. It had, after all, been cared for quite well. Guido's new yacht was stunning and stellar with big jet engines and a turbo propeller. Guido gave tours and found it quite funny that folks were so happy to pay him big money. Just when he thought he had almost enough, a man came aboard with way too much stuff. I have an offer to be quite specific. I'll pay you to ship it to the specific, to the Pacific. Guido set sail on a much larger ship while his poor little yacht went to her slip. The first day at ski, at sea, his spirit, oh, sorry, his spirits just soared. The second day out, he felt a little bit bored. Ooh. He laid on the deck, just sunning his tail. I just the, the wind turned to a blustery gale. The winds and the rains continued for weeks. He was chilled to the bone with little chapped cheeks. One long dark night as he nibbled on toast, he suddenly realized what mattered most. It wasn't the boat or stuff that he had. The small things in life were what made him glad. He missed the music, the soft serenade, singing to sweethearts adrift in the shade. He yelled from the deck, enough is enough. It is not all about big boats and stuff. True to his word, he completed his trip then sailed back home on his big empty ship. Oh, what do you see? That evening neath a glorious warm summer sky, a little gondola zipped quickly by. Dear Guido's sad heart filled up with great joy. Excuse me, young lad, he called to the boy. I'll swap you my ship if you'll come ashore. Keep the blue motor, just leave me the oar. So to this day, in Venice where children still play, a very wise rat ferries tourists each day. Each evening at twilight, beneath the bright moon, his gondola sways to a far away tune. Can you see why I liked it? Um, thank you. I just need to click a few buttons here. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, I liked it. You know, it made me think of me. Um, uh -huh. Hopefully people can still hear me when you did that. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, it made me think a couple years back, we went, my family and I went for a bigger cave when we went to hibernate. Yeah. Because it looked so much more spacious and, you know, 
we were cold all winter and our small little cave made us close mm -hmm. and happier. Sometimes we think bigger and more. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Have you noticed that lately? Well, you know, thank you, uh, Benny, because uh, what we're doing is we're all still hibernating because we're trying to stay away from mm -hmm. this virus. And, um, and that means that we can't do the same things we used to do. So people can't uh, necessarily just be busy all the time. And so we're having to um, find out that a life that's simpler, mm -hmm. um, staying home and maybe being with ourselves, and uh, is enough. And uh, you know, and it's uh, maybe it's more than enough. Um, and maybe it's mm -hmm. just like Guido. Mm -hmm. We don't need um, to be a lot of stuff, and we don't need to have a lot of busy stuff in our life either. Mm -hmm. um, so simple is good. Well, and I heard earlier, I was listening, okay. and earlier that man, you quoted him about saying, it's not about doing, it's about learning to be, yeah. right? Yeah. And Stitch, hi Stitch, he and I, we know about those kind of things because we are we actually can't do a lot. <laughs> yeah. But we can be loving and soft and friendly. Nice, I love it. Yeah. Benny, you saved me. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. by, for bringing a book. Would you come by another Sunday with another book, maybe? I might. Okay, I guess. But I did like the crafts last week, so I'll, oh, I'll yeah. look into that. Hey, oh, look. Hi, Stitch. <laughs> I see you waving. <laughs> and you too, Belle. Okay, I think I should go. I bet. Okay. Are you singing again? Or yeah, are we, we're, we are going to sing. Okay. Actually, well, we're not going to sing. We're going to listen to Lisa. Wait. She's going to play Morning is Broken, and all of us know the words well enough um, that we're just going to watch Lisa. Okay. So I'm hoping that I'm going to mute us. I hope Lisa will unmute herself and oh. that everybody can watch. Thank you, Benny, for coming. Appreciate it. Um, and then, uh, so hopefully Lisa will appear on the screen. Can you hear me? I unmuted. Beautiful, Lisa. Thank you. And it's lovely to, to see you there, to see you playing. Um, yeah. And uh, in your music room in your house there. So. And Morning is Broken is kind of an Easter hymn, too. So uh, lovely that way. Um, thank you, everybody, for <clears throat> putting up with uh, listening to me now for the third Sunday. Um, it's um. 
I, anyway, uh, it's a privilege to have uh, a number of minutes for me to share a message with you and you're all muted and you have to listen and I'm sorry about that. Um, I'd like to share with you something that's really important for me in um, my following uh, the life and teachings of Jesus. I hope it is something that you can understand and it might excite you, it might trouble you. And um, I'd love to hear your feedback. If what I have to say this morning is something that bothers you, then please send me an email or we can talk on the phone. Um, but for me, it's, uh, it's, it's an important learning that I uh, went through in reading some of the progressive theologians that I do. And it fits in um, with uh, the week of Doubting Thomas and uh, the encouragement to not doubt, but to believe. Okay, so uh, the piece that I find is really helpful and I'm gonna do my best to explain it. And I wish I could see all your faces so that you could somehow give me a feedback that you're getting it or not getting it. Cause I may not explain it well enough, but I'll do my best. It's the difference between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. But it's not about time. It's not about who Jesus was two weeks ago versus who Jesus is like today. It's not about time. It's not about chronological time. The difference between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus is who Jesus became in the minds of his devotees and followers after his death and resurrection, that they ended up getting a, a belief in their minds, uh, an idea of Jesus that was elevated, exalted, venerated, uh, deified, that they made something of Jesus that the historical real Jesus, frankly, probably wasn't or wouldn't have recognized himself as. So the, the pre-Easter Jesus is kind of the, the real Jesus, the Jesus who, if, if a human being had have gone up and met this man, would have met a real flesh and blood Galilean man. By the way, uh, the average height of a man back there was four feet seven. So you wouldn't have seen a tall man. But um, who Jesus was in his realness, in his fleshliness, in his humanity, the post-Easter Jesus is the Jesus that people end up having a concept of in their mind of who Jesus was. And again, it was through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of adoration and devotion uh, that, that the post-Easter Jesus became uh, a God, a son of God, a deified person. Now, this is something that I think we can all relate to because all of us, I think it's, it's natural as humans that we, we exalt people in our own minds and we do it in the, we just do it in the in most interesting way. I, I work, I, well, I used to work for Fairmont Hot Springs Resort until they closed down. And I got another job working at a church down the road. But uh, we used to have a CEO of our resort and uh, he was the highest paid person, really nice guy. Um, but it was interesting how staff would see him and treat him differently because he was the CEO of the resort. And I would have staff come up to me and say, you know, I just, I just see this person like he's real and like I don't treat him any different. But the very fact that they needed to tell me that was indicative that there was a temptation to see him as above us, as special, as not quite like the rest of us staff members. That, that's just like at Fairmont Hot Springs Resort. I've heard it said that celebrities have a really hard time making friends because almost no one sees them the way they are. Everybody, like all the fans, see them uh, through this distorted view. So if Tom Hanks, <laughs> for example, if Tom Hanks uh, came to our lives or our churches or came online or something like that, 
uh, maybe after a while, like if you, if if we live with Tom Hanks for a while, I mean, maybe after a while you'd see that he's just like everybody else. But I think for a while, Tom Hanks would be would have an elevated position. Queen Elizabeth <laughs> would. I remember my mother when I was a kid saying that Queen Elizabeth goes to the bathroom just like everybody else. My mother needed to tell me that. My mother needed to tell herself that. My mother was of the same, uh, you know, years as Queen Elizabeth, so so my mother-in-law is, and I think back then, uh, girls, boys and girls, but girls in Canada on the prairies, Queen Elizabeth was very special. So, um, yeah, we we tend to see people through through a distorted lens, if I can put it that way. It happens when people are martyred. So I, I read a book a couple of years ago, on a biography on Gandhi in India, and after he was assassinated, um, someone said that the, uh, the Indian people just started to see him as a god because he was just so venerated, especially after he was killed and martyred. And this might have happened with Martin Luther King Jr. and it might have happened with JFK, that after Kennedy was assassinated, um, something happened. And I probably shouldn't say this, but you know, people have said over the last few years, you know, that if, if Trump was shot, and, and I know one of my responses is I wouldn't want him shot, I wouldn't want him shot because I wouldn't want him shot, but, but I wouldn't want him martyred because if he was martyred, um, then something people would, People would um, maybe do something in their minds about Trump than, than uh, what the real man in his real life is, is and, and so on. Now, um, a few uh, months ago in Golden, I spoke about, it was just the way that the service was, I spoke about the cult of personality that has been a part of human experience uh, throughout human history. And, um, the, the, the main country right now that practices the cult of personality is North Korea. And since the end of World War II and after the Korean War, which was in the early 1950s, uh, there have been three men, uh, all with the name Kim. And uh, the, so there was a, now we'd say the grandfather, then there was a father, and now we have the grandson, Kim Jong-un. They're, they're all Kims. But in North Korea, there's been this cult of personality around their leader. So back in the fall, and on the news, they had a picture of Kim Jong-un having his picture taken with uh, men and women soldiers, and many of them were crying. And the uh, reporter said they're crying because they get to have their picture taken with this exalted leader. They actually call, they, North Koreans are raised to to uh, refer to their leader with terms like exalted and um, so on. And uh, so to have their picture taken with him, they were crying because they've been conditioned to think of these Kim men as being very special. And there's, when the children go to school, they learn that, um, you know, when one of them was born, uh, there was um, the winter, it was sort of in the late winter, but winter just turned into spring and a rainbow appeared in the sky. And uh, when this Kim was six months old, he could walk and talk. And uh, I, I haven't been able to verify these stories, but I know I heard stories like um, the middle Kim, the Papa Kim could, could do 18 holes of golf and get a hole in one and in every hole and stuff like that, which anyway, they have this cult of personality going on in North Korea. This cult of personality has gone on in, in every totalitarian regime. So it was true in uh, the Soviet Union with Stalin. It was true in Germany with Hitler. It was true in China. It was definitely true in Japan. It, uh, you could say it sort of happened with the kings and queens in uh, England and so on, but it certainly was true in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus. There was a cult of personality around the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor. And so the Emperor was called August, uh, Augustus, the one who shall be worshipped. Um, and then on every Roman coin, there was an image of the Emperor with the inscription, Son of God, because, because the Emperor 
was deified and was thought of as God, the Son of God, Lord, Savior. All the words that were used for Jesus were used for the Roman emperor. And it was part of this cult of personality. And I think subversively, it could be that the followers of Jesus uh, subverted the cult of personality of the emperor by developing a cult of personality around Jesus. So thinking of Jesus as the son of God, of God, of the one who had an immaculate conception. Just like Octavian, the Romans were raised, Octavian, his mother was Adias and his father was Apollo. So the story then came that Jesus's mother was Mary and his father was God. So he got half his DNA from God and half his DNA from Mary. And this is all part of the post-Easter Jesus, who Jesus became in the devotional, venerated minds of his followers. Now, all of the New Testament, all of the Gospels, all of the stories we have about Jesus were written by people who were in the post-Easter Jesus mentality. So when we read stories like Jesus walking on water or Jesus turning water into wine or Jesus feeding thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and, and fish or Jesus healing the sick and raising the dead, we need to ask the question, was this the pre-Easter Jesus or was this the post-Easter Jesus? Was this the Jesus who Jesus became in the minds of devotees in the decades after he died? Did they have him walking on water and doing miraculous things? Would the earthly Jesus have done these things? Would the earthly Jesus, would the pre-Easter Jesus recognize himself and who he had become in the minds of people decades later? So there's a difference between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. And frankly, when I read the story of Doubting Thomas, it's a story encouraging people to believe in the resurrected Jesus without any evidence, just on the, the hearsay of others, and that includes us then today. And, and then the, the passage ends so that you may believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, over the years, I've heard people say that they struggle with this because they have doubts and they don't just believe that easily. And what I'd like to say this morning is, I strongly believe in the pre-Easter Jesus. <clears throat> I don't believe in the post-Easter Jesus. I don't believe in the cult of personality that was developed around Jesus. I don't believe in who Jesus became in the exonerated, elevated, exaggerated minds of people in the decades following, that they turn Jesus into a super action figure where half his DNA came from God, half his DNA came from Mary, who really wasn't like us. He was like a super action figure, like a Superman. And um, it kind of pretended to be human and pretended to be like us, but he could really do all these miraculous things. That is the post-Easter Jesus. And uh, if the story of Doubting Thomas is saying you have to believe in the post-Easter Jesus without doubting it, frankly, I think that's similar to people, teachers in North Korea saying to the children, you need to believe in all these stories we're telling you about the Kim grandpa, papa, and grandson, and don't question it and don't doubt it, that the, uh, the rainbow appeared, that the winter turned into spring, that he could walk and talk at six months old. I don't have a need to believe in that Jesus. I want to go on the quest for the historical Jesus. I want to cut through all of that sort of venerated layover that's been laid over him. Find out who the real Jesus was. Because I believe 
that that's enough. I believe that the real Jesus, the, the real flesh and blood Jesus, the human Jesus, it's the one that I can relate to, is like me and like you and like us. And there was a teaching there that would change my life and change the world. I read this week at the end of a beautiful book that I have, that Jesus was the most conscious person in the world when he was crucified. He was a conscious person crucified by an unconscious world. And he invites us to be conscious ourselves. So what does it mean to wake up? What does it be mean to become more conscious in this world? I like that. I want that. I can follow that. And the, the pre-Easter Jesus, I believe, was about that and was teaching that. I can believe that. I can't believe in who Jesus became in the minds of others after he died, that post-Easter Jesus. And in closing, I just want to say, I always have to be worried when I say, I just want to say, because usually it turns into something more. But recently I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, was talking about his daughter who's uh, in her early 20s, who grew up more or less going to church, but doesn't go to church anymore. And uh, my friend said he, she, she no longer believes that, he, she, that Jesus was the Son of God. I wish I could talk to her and say, I don't believe in that Jesus either. And I, as a minister, I don't want to encourage people to believe in this cult of personality Jesus, the post-Easter Jesus. If I could explain to her this concept about the pre-Easter Jesus, the post-Easter Jesus to say, um, let's talk, let's go on a search for the historical Jesus, and maybe there's something real there, authentic, that she could go, yeah, that Jesus I could get interested in. That Jesus I could learn more about. I, I, and, um, and, and I, it's, she's just one person, but I think there's a whole lot of people, and we know some of them, and some of them are young people, that the other stuff just doesn't make sense any longer. And the, the Jesus of the creeds the, and so on is uh, it's just not, this doesn't make sense to them. And I agree with them. And, uh, and this is why um, understanding the difference between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus, I think is crucial. Um, we need to find out who Jesus really was and love that person. And I think we can. Thanks for listening again to me today. Okay, I'm going to do the shared screen again. Find out where we are. Ah, another Easter hymn. Uh, In the bulb there is a flower. So Carolyn and Greg, please.
Thank you, Carolyn and Greg. And now Tess is going to lead us in our prayer time. And uh, we won't have words up on the screen. Uh, just that nice image there to look at. And Tess, uh, I trust that you can unmute yourself and, and we'll hear you. We'll let you know when we hear you. I think I've just succeeded. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay. you now. Okay. Thanks. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with thanks and gratitude for the ability to gather in such a way as to be able to be together while apart. We ask for your presence with us as we continue to live in ways that will help us to maintain our own health and that of all we care about and come in contact with. Be with us as we give thanks for all those who are working in so many ways to care for those afflicted with the virus. We give our thanks too for those who are in industries that support all of us, be it those on the front line or those working to ensure that we are well fed and more. Your love and caring is shown in the many ways that we, your people, are giving support and encouragement to everyone affected. There are so many who are sick and struggling with their own grief and health issues. May those in our church family and community feel your gentle loving touch as they deal with the loss of a loved one, ill health, struggles with coping as well as are dealing with isolation. This is also a time of renewal. We look to your creation shedding winter's coat and coming to life as we begin our planning for our gardens. May we feel your loving guidance as we go about our daily lives in new ways and give support to each other during this difficult time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beautiful, Tess. <clears throat> Thank you for leading us in our prayer time. And uh, last week, uh, we sang this and Carolyn and Greg let, let us in it. And it's just uh, such a uplifting piece. We're going to sort of close our service. We'll almost close our service with this, uh, Carolyn and Greg. Okay, guys. Um, so we'll probably do this <clears throat> three times again. And uh, last week I had suggested that if anybody has any percussion instruments, such as shakers at home, that they could be using them. And if you don't have a shaker, never mind, just go to the kitchen and get two spoons. Um, when I was growing up, some of you may or may not know that I'm from Quebec and uh, grew up partially in Ontario, and we used to go camping a lot. And uh, partway into the night, my dad would take out the spoons. And so uh, how you do that is you put your spoons back one uh, like this with the backs towards each other, and then, you hold it in your dominant hand and you stick your index finger kind of towards the back like that with your thumb on top, then index finger and the other three fingers underneath. Then I have to stand up to do this. You stick your, on your knee, you put the spoons like this. Can't do it very well. Need to practice but you bounce it up and down with the palm of your hand like this. So if any of you have time to get your spoons and help me out, my sister very nicely actually gave me a fancy pair of spoons. So I don't have to, uh, it's e they're even held at the end so I, they don't go flying off. So I may try that today. And Wendy, apologies to Wendy because she's our percussion person and she is bang on with her rhythm. I know that I am not 100% bang on, but you know what? We're just having fun, so let's just go for it. Take it away, Greg. <laughs> Hallelujah. We 
I think you must have got um, a number of different percussion instruments going there. I wish I could have watched what people were doing. Nice, that's uh, such an uplifting song. So uh, we draw our service on this Sunday to a close. On the surface, the story of today encourage us, encourages us, us to believe and not to doubt. But then it may not be that simple. <clears throat> there is a time to believe and a time to doubt. There is wisdom in the words, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. Certainty leads to dogma. Dogma is the end of searching, learning, and growing. Doubting can come from an honest desire to look more and learn more. May we go into our moments ahead, wanting to have a firsthand experience of the sacred and the more, not settling for the answers or beliefs others want us to have but finding our own authentic experience in the way that the historical Jesus wanted us to walk. Amen. Ah, beautiful. Well, uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, the gallery view so I can see more people. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> before we break into our, our little chat,